facts about you. So he's very dynamic, competent, reliable, nice. He understands the banking world very well. He's just the right person for being the head of data analytics at PICTA. He works on very interesting problems, but before joining PICTA, he did a master at EPFL in communication systems with a specialization in signal processing. So I think we did have the same professors, although he's much younger than me, so, but uh, okay. He has more than 10 years of experience in the wealth management industry. So we're looking forward for, to hearing you for, from you. Welcome, Stefan Singh. Thank you. <laughs> May I ask you the, the remote? It's there, no problem, thank you. Great, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to NetGuardians for inviting me uh, to present uh, today my case study, Unusual Bank Transaction Detector. So I'm starting with a few words about myself. My name is Stefan Singh. Um, I'm an EPFL engineer, as Stefan said. Uh, after graduating, I worked two years as a consultant, and then I moved to PICTA. So it was 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, during those 11 years, uh, I had several roles there, uh, such as um, Chief Operating Officer of the Legal Department and uh, Head of a team of Strategic and uh, Transversal Project Management. Now and for 18 months, I'm in charge of a data analytics uh, unit working on private client data. So it's very impressive for me to be in front of you today, but it's a pleasure to present you my case study. So uh, the presentation will be structured as follow. First, I will give you a, a quick overview of the context and the ecosystem, and then I will explain you how my team uh, acquired its expertise in private client data and the mandate we received. Then I will detail this mandate, and this mandate is the case study on the three, and finally, I will conclude. C'est bon comme ça? Perfect. So as I said, I will not spend too much time on this slide because if you are here, uh, I'm sure you are already aware that protecting your bank or protecting your company against fraud is one of the current hottest topic. And if you are not convinced yet, uh, I suggest you have a drink uh, during the cocktail with uh, one of NetGuardian's guys. And I'm sure they will have many slides and many use cases to convince yourself that it's a very important topic. Um, so how this hot, hot topic gets into my team? Um, before being the head of data analytics, I was in charge of a uh, team working on regulatory and legacy projects, such as uh, um, tax transparency, formal documentation of the clients, Panama Papers, automatic exchange of information, European Union blacklist, and so on. And all those projects have um, the same common uh, starting point, the access to data, and access to data to identify the clients, to make KPIs follow up, to define the exposure of the bank, to uh, define the transaction, identify transaction between clients, to make key risk indicators, and so on. So working on those projects, we began a few years ago to work with Excel, our analysis, and then uh, on tactical database using Access. And then a few years ago, we had an industrialized database, but with tactical data science tools. And now today, we have an industrialized database with integrated data science tools. So thanks to this expertise acquisition and knowing the context that just previously uh, uh, present, I received the following mandate from our top management. Can we improve the current plan creating a detector of unusual transaction? And I received a few days and actually four days to make a proof of concept on that. So 
this proof of, proof of concept is the case study I will present you now. So um, here we go. Um, as every project in my team, we look on the whole data analysis value chain. So first, we have to define the scope, understand clearly the mandate, then, if necessary, acquire the data we don't have, then we have to cleanse this data and structure this data in order to analyze it. And analyze it. Uh, we have to define features we want to observe and uh, define a methodology. In this case, we will use machine learning. And finally, uh, and industrialize the process. So the next slide will detail each of these steps. So let's start on the scope. The first issue we had uh, was to understand clearly the mandate. What does it mean? Can we improve the current plan creating a detector of unusual transactions? So after, after a few discussions with our experts, we could translate this uh, mandate to identify a set of known past unusual transactions or fraudulent transactions uh, of group banks using a machine learning algorithm. You got it. We have a set of known unusual transactions and we want to build a tool that will be able to uh, identify those in the past, but maybe all the potential unusual transactions. Great, so now we, we could translate the mandates, but we still have questions. What are those? What is the past? What is transaction? What is group banks? So you may know that PICTE is the uh, international group. We have several banks uh, uh, worldwide and uh, some uh, uh, rep offices. So for this POC, we decided to focus on one servicing center of Zurich. For the transactions, if you don't work in a bank, you can't imagine the number of kind of transaction we have in bank. So we have security transfer, sec events, uh, forex, uh, card transaction, fund redemption, payments, a lot of different kind of transactions. So for this POC, we decided to focus only on payments and payment from our bank to external banks. Finally, what does past mean for this POC? We decided to limit the time frame to three years because even if we have a banking system for many years uh, at PICTE, uh, we wanted to limit the amount of data we had. And that's my advice, start small. If you have to build that kind of tool, don't take all the data you, you can just start on, on, on a limited scope because you will see afterwards you will have to work on those data and see if you have too much data, it's gonna be too much work. So well, now we have defined our scope uh, and we have to find the data we need. But where are the data? In a bank, such as I guess many other industries, we have many different systems and that are silo systems that do not communicate uh, with each other. So here I illustrate some of the system we could have at PICTE. So we have a system to log the interaction of the banker with the clients, another system to log the e-banking connections, another system, this is our banking system with the transactions made by the clients. We have finance tools, for example, to uh, compute the net new money, the tarification of the clients. We have documentation, uh, all the client documentation are stored in a specific uh, tool. Reference data, for example, for the assets. Visit of the clients when the clients visit the bank. And client systems where we store the private client uh, data. It's not complete, it's just an overview of the system we have and no one of them communicates with each other. So for our uh, proof of concept, we choose three systems, we identify three systems with data we needed. One, of course, is the banking system where we store the transactions. Another is one reference data that are the destination bank, names of bank and country of incorporation of banks. And the client system, in this case, to identify the domicile of the clients. 
Uh, if I can give you an advice on this one is if you are building now a data team, um, try to have a data scout in your team. And data scout is somebody with a large access rights to uh, many systems and a good business knowledge. And this guy could help you to quickly identify the systems and the data you need. Next, so great, now we have the data, but it's not finished because uh, we have another issue, irregular uh, quality uh, in the systems. It's good to very good in our banking system because it's an operational system, but uh, it could decrease our non-operational system. And let's look at those three tables. If I take the banking system, as I said, it's a good to very good quality. However, you can see here I have two fields that are not the best quality, destination account and destination country, that are not structured. You can have an IBAN uh, stored in a destination account, but you can also have a post-finance account or another kind of account. So it's not a structured field. Same thing we have for the destination country in our system, uh, it was not a structured field. Second system, the client system, we have uh, an issue on the client domicile. Actually, the client domicile is structured, but we do not have a NISO code to identify the country. You will understand just afterwards uh, what why it's a problem. And for the reference data, when we want to identify the banks, uh, we have two issues. The first one, the bank's name are not structured, and you will see just afterwards uh, why it's a problem, and the country of incorporation, it's structured, but not ISO neither. So I illustrate the data cleansing on those two examples. Um, if you do not have a common reference, uh, such an uh, ISO code for a country, you cannot know if uh, China Republic of stored in one system and China in another system is the same country. So for this POC, we had to cleanse the data and make in place um, a mapping table. Same thing, uh, mapping table to create because the data, the bank's name are not structured, u.b.s.sa, UBS AG and UBS Switzerland is the same bank. So we had to create a mapping table to, to tell that those three were uh, the same destination bank. So after cleansing the data, we produce uh, one master file, a structured master file with one line per transaction and every field we need uh, in column. If I can you give you an advice, spend time on the cleansing and the structuring of your cleansing because everything you will do that can be reusable after by your algorithm or for other department of the bank, you can use it to cleanse the uh, root system. For example, in our client register, they have afterwards cleanse the root system. Great, so from now we have a clean file and we can start to play a bit with it. So for these POC, we had to define interpretable features for our algorithm. So we decided to uh, set six features. The first one is the wealth bands. We assume that a rich client will be more often targeted by a fraudster than a poor client. Actually, we do not have many poor clients at Picte, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, uh, we, de we decided to put three features. So one for clients between zero and one million, two for cl clients between one million and 100 million, and three for clients above uh, 100 million. So for example, in this case, this account with these assets under management, we put a three in our data set. Then we assume that a new usual transaction we would be higher than a usual transaction. So same thing, we put a band on transaction. And for example, for this account and this transaction of 100,000 Swiss francs, we put a four because we had a four between uh, uh, 100,000 to 1 million. 
then uh, we assume that uh, an unusual transaction will vary at an account level uh, of the other transactions. So for this reason, at an account level, here we have one account and four transactions, we computed the standard deviation of the transaction and as a feature we put the ratio of the transaction and the standard deviation. Uh, then we also assume that a client will have as usual transaction the same currency. So for this reason we calculated the percentage of dilution of currency of transactions. So in this case here you have one client with three transactions, one third of the transactions are in CHF, two thirds are in euros. So we compute here the inverse as a feature. Then the, la the, uh, the fifth uh, one, uh, we assume that a client will have usual transaction in its domicile country and unusual transaction uh, could be in another country. So for this reason, we compare the destination country with the domicile of the client and if it was the same, we put a zero. If it was different, we put a one as a feature. Uh, finally, uh, we assumed uh, also that there were r uh, riskier country and uh, country that uh, where frauds uh, were mo more often happening. So we receive a list from our risk department with some countries. In this example, I put Japan and a one if it was a risky country, zero if it was not. So. Um, the best advice I can give you is to define your features with your risk or fraud specialist internally. Uh, in this case, in this POC, we defined all those features in my team and we are not fraud specialists, but discussing after that we are a fraud speci specialist, we understood that we could have uh, used many other uh, features and many uh, maybe more smarter uh, um, features. Okay, so now we have a clean data set with several features we can observe. So uh, we have now to define a machine learning methodology. Uh, as I said, we have examples of uh, unusual or fraudulent uh, transactions. So we can label and we can use a supervised machine learning model. What we want to do is to classify is the transaction usual or unusual? So it's called the binary classification. I guess everybody now is expert, uh, thanks to the your presentation before. So uh, binary classification and one uh, academic algorithm is the logistic regression, is the one uh, uh, we put in place. Um, so wa one of the data scientists of my unit uh, implements this algorithm using R and we use 70% of our past example training and 30% uh, as testing and adapting a bit uh, the algorithm. So I'm showing you the results on the confusion uh, matrix. So I put here percentages instead of real figure, actual figures for, confidenti for confidentiality reason. Um, what does those figures mean? It means that here we have 90, our algorithm classify 93% of known unusual transactions are unusual transactions, so it's a good result, and 99.95% of known usual transactions are usual, so we can uh, say that it's a good result. However, our algorithm classify 7% of our known unusual transactions are usual, so it's not a very good quality, it's not enough to put that kind of uh, process live in production. Finally, we have 0.05% of potential uh, false positive. Our algorithm classify those as uh, unusual, but we didn't know that they were, so uh, we have to check every uh, transactions. Uh, so this POC was a success because we have make reviewed all those transactions by our risk uh, specialists and uh, they were convinced and we could convince our management that it was a good idea for our bank to put that kind of methodology uh, in place. 
Uh, however, as I said, the precision was not sufficient, so I will explain you later um, the final decision. Uh, as the in the previous presentation, here we have an imbalance uh, uh, data set. So, as advice, we could have uh, oversample uh, the uh, past example or undersample our uh, data set. Or now I know that uh, thanks to Professor Bertapi, we could you have used SMOTES, so maybe uh, you can take that as an advice. So now you are able to build your own uh, unusual transaction detector. Uh, and I just told you that Adpictet was a success uh, in your sites, but the problem is not the end. The success in a uh, data project is, uh, can you repeat that? Now we just have one shot. We have identified a set of transactions, but are we able to do that every day or, uh, or detect a fraud before the funds leave the bank? If you want to do that, you have to industrialize the full chain to automatize all the instructions I present you before, the cleansing, so automatize the cleansing you, you have made, automatize the structuring, and adapt your uh, operational systems, such as your banking application. So this work is a huge investment uh, in uh, development, uh, technical development, and time. Uh, secondary, secondary uh, as soon as you identify hit, you must review and classify as a true positive or a false positive and retrain your algorithm. Uh, moreover, do, do you do not underestimate the time of the review. It takes a lot of time to review just one hit. I can give you as an advice, if you do not, if you do not have yet that kind of plan in your bank. Start on a rule-based control. Uh, don't need to start with a machine learning control. Just put basic uh, rule-based controls and you can use uh, some of the features I present earlier. Uh, in conclusion, uh, after making uh, these uh, proof of concept, uh, we've learned a lot uh, on uh, detecting uh, uh, fraudulent transactions and we could convince our top management to invest in that kind of tool. However, Picta is today a 5,000 employee company, and we could, we could not stop with that kind of small proof of concept. So for this reason, um, we met many different specialists, and we, we put in place a formal request for proposal, and uh, maybe as you can, as you have seen in the in the newspapers a few months ago, we work now with NetGuardians, and we have improved our control framework plan, thanks to them. So, it's done for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> and don't know if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for a few questions, if that is fine for you. So let's use that time. Okay, let's start. Hi. Uh, I wanted to know to understand the complexity of the POC, uh, how many people were working on the team, and also what criteria did you use to select the subset of the data and other things that you chose to analyze for the POC. Okay. What criteria? Yes, because four days is very impressive, so and we I definitely want to know more, right? <laughs> but maybe uh, two things. First, of first thing, uh, we had a lot, already a lot of data in our industrialized database. That's one, one thing, except the transactions. So we didn't have the transactions. So we had to uh, take the transaction, but I'm a lucky guy. I have a data scout in my team. So during the four days, the data scout and a data scientist have worked together. So the data scout have, has worked on extraction of, uh, of the transaction and dumping it in our database and on the cleansing. And during the same time, the data scientist has worked in implementing the algorithm. Two people. The criteria of? You mean the six the feature criteria. we choose? No, no, because you said, okay, we have uh, these data sources and we chose to focus on, on this. 
type of data source or also only on amount uh, on, on payments instead of also other or of cards etc did you analyze anything about the data to choose in fact those in fact we defined we, def we defined the features before extracting so ex so the features help us to define which uh, data we needed to extract okay you have to define you have to define your, your features before that's right so you didn't analyze any type of like percent of fraud that you observed to tackle that particular um, area? No, the yeah. thing is, we didn't know the, sh the scheme of frauds. So we didn't uh, have a look uh, on the frauds. We just use this and then implement. But we didn't know if the frauds were uh, higher. We, di we didn't know if the client was rich. We didn't know if it was in another kind of currency. Those are only assumptions. Mm -hmm. And it worked, almost, 93%. Okay. Anyone else? In this slide, I didn't understand why you categorize uh, the, the numerical amount. I, I, I guess you, you're losing information like that. I didn't understand, for instance, the amount you make the three classes. Why you just don't take the, the raw value? I mean, yeah, yeah, the amount. Here. Yeah, yeah. Why do you transform that in classes? One, two, in one? Because we have a we have a, a very different kind of clients. We yeah, have man, but I mean, any machine learning algorithm could deal with that. I mean, you don't need to transform any. Yeah, just uh, just. Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, I guess you should try with the original data. And the thing you is are losing information like that. That's the the thing is, yeah. uh, we 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 thought that if it was. We, we could not imagine that this client was uh, uh, 100 uh, times more um, important than this one. Yeah, but it's uh, machine learning algorithm is supposed indeed to, to, okay. to calibrate that and uh, just to make it non-linear if it is the case from... I wouldn't do that. Just uh, Okay, just thank mm -hmm. you for the advice. <laughs> you do have a point, but it's true that, you know, on a four days POC, sometimes mm -hmm. you do things and you don't really have time to come back. You do things because of an idea, you know how it is. Anybody else? Thanks a lot. Um, quick question. Uh, how fast can you detect fraud? How much time do you have before you say, or an unusual transaction before you say to someone, hey, this is unusual, please uh, send this money back? So this is uh, just a POC, yeah, huh, but right? In, I mean, in, in practice, if you have such a system in production, how much time? do you have at your disposal to make a decision? I can't an answer to this question because I, I'm, I'm not working in the fraud department. Right. So, okay. But I guess it's, uh, it's not, not very long because we have to, to take the funds back. So uh, it's like 20, 24 hours, I guess, something like this. Thank you. If you want to get the fund back. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, if you don't mind, Stefan, I will cut the question a little earlier. We'll try to recover a little bit of uh, how much we have been late uh, after the last break. Let's try to have this break uh, right on time. I just wanted to tell you one more thing before we go to the break. I'm very happy about what happened so far. I'm very happy about all this presentation. And if you look at what happened, we started with uh, Jakey, which presented us a very high level, you know, perspective from cyber crime and, and cyber criminality fighting and financial crime of what it means to fight fraud. And then we went a little lower, you know, in the stack looking at from a business perspective, what were the implication, what also from a project management perspective, how fraud fighting is done. And this, I guess, Professor Bontempi gave us simply all the scientific keys required to understand what one's doing when one's, you know, designing fighting fraud methods with artificial intelligence. And here now we are, at the, we are at the stage where we have a concrete use case, you know, with a clear scope implemented in four days, benefiting from all of that. So, so far it's been really brilliant. Thank you very much for your speech, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks again, Stefan. Merci beaucoup.